Gustavo is coming to talk about a very interesting topic today, and it is the experience for decentralized water treatment, wastewater treatment, and reuse of this wastewater that for the case of the Caribbean and the Crew Press Project, this is a very relevant topic. We're supporting many countries in terms of policies in the reuse of wastewater and almost all the projects that were implemented in one or another way have this relationship of reusing wastewater. And because of the circular economy now, I think that this is very relevant. So I'm very glad to have Gustavo here. Gustavo is an engineer. He has specialization in urban water management in Sweden and Japan. He has worked in the development of basic services for growing citizens. He founded Aguatuja Foundation that is going to be telling us about the experience. And he specializes in projects that contribute precisely to what I was mentioning, which is the urban cycle of water. He has also been a consultant of the World Bank and CAF in terms of water and sanitation all over the world. So with this and without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Gustavo. Gustavo, just before you uh, introduce yourself, you let me know and I just move the slides for you. So please go ahead, Gustavo. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Joaquin. To give you a little bit of the context, I have been asked to talk a little bit about our experience in the wastewater treatment and reuse. This is a work that we have developed in different contexts. First, in several countries of Asia and Africa, in the context of a program that is called Citywide of Inclusive Sanitation in the World Bank, where we want to promote universal access to sanitation services. And we have realized that when we talk about sanitation, we have to talk about general terms. We have to include many types of solutions and different technologies. So for example, we have realized that if we just focus 100% in conventional sewage, there are places and areas of the cities that will never be covered because you may take too long to get there with the services. So this is where we have been working on developing different sanitation options, including the smart uh, sewage, the inner sewage, the decentralized uh, treatment system, which is what we will be talking about today. So with that contextual information, we can move to the next slide, please, Joaquin. It is good for us to understand, first of all, what we mean by wastewater, how they are generated and the main characteristics. Just give me a second, because I think the slides are not moving forward. Let me see what happens. There we go. Okay. Just allow me a second, please. Okay. I think I got it. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I was telling you that it is important for us to have a clear idea of what we mean by wastewater and some of the main characteristics. For example, when we see the switch water that gets to the treatment plant, use a really dark water. It seems to have a lot of solid, a lot of contaminant. But there is some information here that sometimes attracts the attention when we talk about these parameters with the engineers, with the population, and even with the authorities. Next slide, please. From 100% of the wastewater, only 0.1% is solids, and 99.9% .9 
of these water from such as water as such. So it's basically water. There is a very little proportion that's solid, but this is where we find all the contaminants. When we talk about the domestic or municipal wastewater, basically 70% of the contamination in those uh, wastewater is organic materials and only 30% is inorganic. So this is what makes it difficult to treat the wastewater. Why? Because removing that 0.1% of contaminants is like looking for a needle in a, a haystack. So we need a lot of time of attention. We need infrastructure. We need chemicals. And all those are even economic resources that we have to devote to remove that 0.1% of solids from the water that would otherwise be pure water. So that is what makes the work difficult and expensive. Next slide. Okay, so the importance of treating wastewater, we can move to the next one, no problem. We have over there, I detail more contaminants, but that is not so important. So why is it important to treat wastewater? What happens if we do not treat wastewater? Next slide. These are the different contaminants that we introduce into wastewater through our use, either domestic or industrial, organic burden, for example. Domestic uh, wastewater has a lot of organic burden because we are discarding feces. In the case of urine, we uh, eat a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen. There are some solids that also get in the houses also in the streets, in industrial uses. And finally, we can also introduce metals and chemical compounds. So each of these contaminants that are different would affect water and the environment in a different way. Next slide. So we can see, for example, how the presence of a high organic burner reduces the presence of oxygen. So it generates an anaerobic environment in the water. And when we introduce nitrogen and phosphorus, with a physis, for example, that promotes the growth of algae in the water. So water becomes dark black. When there is a, a lot of solids suspended in the water, sand and so on, there may be sand, dirt coming from the, the roads. When there is rain and so on, there is intermission into the sewage system. So that increases the turbidity of the water. And when we talk about industrial liquid waste, there may be metals or other more hazardous chemicals that, that would directly affect the systems. So we can see how each of these contaminants degrade the quality of water and would ultimately affect and have a negative impact on the environment and the water bodies that are once again downstream sources of water for other environmental uses or for people's use. So although the amount of water that exists in the world is fixed and is a large amount, what happens where we contaminate the water is that we reduce the amount of clean water available for people. We still have the same amount of water, but we have more contaminated water and less clean water. Next. Right here, we have worldwide statistics about the coverage of wastewater treatment depending on the type of countries. High income countries have higher levels of coverage in terms of wastewater treatment and it goes down as the countries are poorer. So in South America and Central America, most of the countries are mid low income countries or at least are poor countries. When we talk about mid low income, we're between 8-28% of wastewater that is treated in an appropriate way in our country. So the challenge is huge. Very, very little water, wastewater has been treated. And if we see this at the global level, is that less than 10% of the wastewater that's treated at the appropriate level, I would say. Next slide. So from here, we can see the importance of treating wastewater. And now we're going to go a little bit more into how to do it, how this can be done. Next slide.
When we talk about the water cycle, we can think about evaporation of oceans and forests and trees, the water that falls into the mountains and so on, and goes back as runoff and then infiltration. So that is like the normal water cycle. There is also an urban water cycle where is where we're going to focus a little bit more. So it's very important to sustainably manage the urban cycle of water, as we can see here in the chart, because when paving, when building uh, concrete infrastructures, we're damaging, we're breaking this cycle of water. So in the urban cycle of water, we have to promote, for example, infiltration. The less asphalt we have, the better we're going to be able to infiltrate. And we're going to avoid flooding and runoffs on the streets. The more trees and parks and green areas we have in the city, the more we're going to promote the evaporation of water. And we also reinforce the natural cycle of water. And when we use water as potable water in the city that we contaminate, then we have to treat wastewater to also give them some use either for green waters or to dispose this to a water body, but in an appropriate way so that we would not be contaminating that body. So we can promote this urban cycle of water or we can damage this. So in order to protect this cycle and in order to protect the environment, It is very important to do a good management of that cycle. That urban cycle of water can be managed at different scales. So we go to the smaller scale that is less uh, centralized. We can have rainwater falling on the house and we have to do whatever is possible to infiltrate it. If there is a rain drainage, then this is where the rainwater has to go. If there is a sewage system, it is not correct to power rainwater into that sewage because it should only have domestic uh, wastewater. So if there is no sewage network, then we can treat wastewater in situ in the same house that can be black water or gray water. When we talk about wastewater, this is when we have made any use of the water and we have contaminated them. When we talk about black water, this is water containing uh, feces and when we talk about great water we're talking about the rest of the water those that do not contain feces water that come from the sink or the shower and so on next slide so right there we have the example of treatment in situ that can be very simple as simple as a very traditional or elemental septic tank or it could be very advanced with a membrane reactor or something intermediate like the one we see now in the image where we have the primary treatment and the secondary treatment it can even include disinfection so the treatment of water can be done at different scales and at different levels of treatment too next slide now we see a more centralized treatment. So instead of treating in each house, we can treat in groups of houses. It could be neighborhoods and small decentralized plants in maybe districts. Or it can even be like the whole city or big areas of the city. And that's what we call centralized treatment. So in the image, we can see a treatment process with the lagoons. In this case, we have modified a lagoon treatment plant that had been abandoned. And we have put this anaerobic reactor that you see to the left. That is an anaerobic reactor that has been put into the drain system to increase the capacity of treatment, avoid smells, and improve the final result. Next slide. So we have been able to see first a completely decentralized treatment in situ, and on the other hand, a centralized treatment. In both cases, or in all cases, it is necessary to have 
a treatment process to uh, purify the water. And these are the steps. What you see on the screen are the main stages or the components of this treatment line. So it is very important, first of all, and we're going to make a lot of emphasis into this, we have the pretreatment that allows to separate the larger solid particles, any object that may get there. Sometimes there's bags, plastics, garbage, and so on. Once we have gone through that pretreatment stage, we get into a primary treatment where we basically uh, Everything that is uh, sedimented goes to the bottom. What can float goes up. And then we get an output that would only have suspended solids and it's not going to have anything settling or anything floating. And then we get into the secondary treatment, which is one step forward. It's a little bit more advanced. And this is where we reduce the organic matter and the organic load or burden that is uh, suspended so we can eliminate all the sand or the fat and everything but the organic matter is completely dissolved in the water and that is going to get into the secondary treatment and finally the tertiary treatment is more specialized where we remove very specific contaminants it is a more advanced uh, treatment, we could say more expensive. Normally we can remove the nitrogen, the phosphorus, for example, which contribute to a process of the uh, growth of algae in these uh, bodies. And then we can also use a process of water disinfection using chlorine or others. So basically those are the four stages or the four components of the whole treatment process. Waste water treatment can include one or more of these processes. Just making a pretreatment is better than not doing anything. Just doing a pretreatment and a primary treatment is a great step forward. If all the switch systems in the world would have this primary treatment, or if all the houses had an in situ system that does up to the primary treatment, that could already solve like half of the problem of wastewater in the world. Obviously, it is desirable to have a secondary treatment to remove the organic matter, but with a primary treatment, we can get to 30-40% of the removal of contaminants. As we move forward in the treatment, the treatment is richer, there's more efficiency in removal, but it is also more expensive. Next, please. Here, we're gonna make emphasis in the pre-treatment because in the experiences that we see of municipal systems and community systems and so on, either decentralized or centralized, we see that many times, no enough importance is given to the pretreatment. So the treatment plants end up treating everything. They end up treating solid waste. And as it is with the lagoons, for example, it is more difficult to remove those solids after the lagoons than removing them at the entry of the plant. So we have seen that in 80% of the cases of the plants that we have visited in Latin America, in 80% of the cases, there were pretreatment problems. So by doing a good pretreatment, it was possible to protect the whole plant and improve the process. Pretreatment is like a kind of uh, a use for the plant. It protects everything that goes uh, downstream. There are lots of types for the pretreatment. It could be manual or automatic. It could be fixed screens, removable screens. It could be automatic. So it all depends on the type of plant that we want to design, the flow rate, and the type of manual work we want or do not want to have in that plant. Next slide. So what we have seen there is a revolving screen. This is a revolving drum for smaller plants. In industrial uses, we can also have this. So we have been reducing the size of this because we have seen that the more solids we're able to remove at the entry point, the better 
the process is going to be and we're just going to end up treating water, which is what we actually want to treat. So this has to go to solid waste, solid waste management. So if the plants in Bolivia, for example, many years ago, they had fixed greens with a separation of 10 centimeters. Now we have come to then five centimeters and three centimeters. And this automatic equipment we have been using now, we went to 10 millimeters, then six millimeters, then three millimeters. And in some plants, we're now working with one and a half millimeters. So this is a really a very important step that we need to take into account. This is another revolving screen that's treating water before it gets into the anaerobic reactor. In this case, we're using the three millimeters for the separation in the screen. This one is a little bit bigger. It's a canal screen. The difference between the previous and this one is that in the previous one, we have to pump the water for it to get to the screen and then by gravity it goes to the next step. But in this case, the screen is introduced into the approach canal to the plant. So the water that is coming by gravity to the plant just goes through the screen. So it is not necessary to pump it. So we can see inside the screen, this is what's called a helicoidal screen. You see that's like an iron with some holes at the bottom. Water is going to go through and solid waste is going to remain up there. And then these crops will be moving them towards some containers. This is an uh, automatic screen with a revolving uh, part. It is also installed in the canal. This type of screen can manage big flow rates from 10 liters per second up to uh, more than 100. So we can, and we can put several of them in parallel. So these rotating screens are usually for larger plants. And those with the drum or the helicoidal is for smaller plants. Okay, next. Right here, we can see that we have the uh, output where the solid waste, this little cart where the solid waste falls. So when it's manual, it really generates a lot of uh, work for the operator. So that implies a lot of costs also. And if the work is not done, then the plant may be affected. Next slide. In this case, this is an elevator station. This is an elevator station where the wastewater is pumped towards a plant that is several kilometers away. But in that station, I mean, in all elevated stations, we can do the pre-treatment to remove the solids. Next. That was the pre-treatment. Then, and the, the primary treatment is basically to get the sediments and then see the floating materials. I'm not going to get into a lot of details for the primary treatment. But now we can talk a little bit more about the secondary treatment where we want to remove the organic matter, the biological uh, load over there. So we can see here an example that can be used both in in-situ solutions as well as in community or neighborhood solutions, either decentralized or centralized. To the left, we see basically a septic tank, two-chamber septic tank. This is all gonna have the primary treatment. It's just a separation of sediments and the uh, greasing, degreasing. Then we can see the primary treatment and the secondary treatment where we can separate the organic matter. We can consider, for example, an aerobic, an aerobic uh, treatment where we put water into the water, we make it bubble, we feed the aerobic organisms uh, nerves, and when they grow and develop, they are going to generate some biofilms. In this case, we see a treatment plant that has a support uh, means there is some aeration and uh, that's uh, important. I think somebody has the microphone on there. Sorry, go ahead. 
Next slide. Okay, this is a picture of the same plan, organic load reduction. In the secondary treatment, there may be anaerobic or aerobic processes. The aerobic processes consume energy because we have to inject air into the water. And in both cases, in the aerobic as well as the anaerobic processes, there is always going to be sludge generation that we have to remove from the treatment plant. What you see in the picture is an aerobic treatment where we have a fixed uh, means where the biofilm that I mentioned is going to be developing. There is a very interesting characteristic here about the anaerobic characteristic and is that it generates less sludge than the aerobic because this sludge is digested in the uh, process because the digested sludge that comes out of an anaerobic treatment can be dried at the sun and then it can be introduced as a soil improving agent. Well, when we have second aerobic secondary treatment um, once the, the sludge is generated in a greater amount, it has to be removed more often, and then it has to be treated. First, it has to be stabilized. So in that case, and many times, there is an anaerobic reactor specifically for the treatment of the sludge. Next slide. This is the same type of plants. We use that technology basically for in-situ solutions and for a solution of the centralized water treatment. That could be their hospital, school, some houses, like a part of a neighborhood that we know has, I don't know, 10,000 inhabitants, for example. So we can use this type of modular technology in a decentralized way. Next slide. We can be more sophisticated. This is a membrane technology where we can do the filtration of the water. This is used mainly well, with that. We can filter even viruses. There is microfiltration or ultrafiltration. So the advantage is that you have a clear output with less contaminants, but on the other hand, you need more energy to make water go through these membranes. Next slide. Well, there are some characteristics over there of the treatment with the membrane. To compare that a little bit with the lagoon system, we can reduce the organic load, the BOD, the uh, biological oxygen demand. We get into the plant with 300, 400 milligrams per liter, for example. In a lagoon system, we may have 30 in the output. In this membrane system, we have less than 5 milligrams per liter in the output. So this is more advanced. Next slide. And right here, we can see these systems in pictures that are more widely used. And this is for decentralized systems, especially if we want to do some advanced reuse to the water in a building, for example, if we want to reuse waste uh, water to wash, uh, do the laundry or to wash cars or to uh, clean floors, and then we want uh, an output that is clear and disinfected and so on. So this type of technology can be considered perhaps not for big municipal plants, where it would be very difficult to get to this level of treatment. Next slide. The efficiency of the treatment is then the degree of contaminant removal. What you see in the image is a sample on how water inputs the uh, plant and how it is output. And this is something that we can accomplish with very simple technology. With natural processes, it is not necessarily necessary to get to membranes or very sophisticated processes to accomplish a removal of 90% of the contaminants, which is what you currently see in the picture. Next slide. So, 
precisely to measure how the plants are doing and what type of work they do on their efficiency, we use some indicators of our wastewater that we measure at the entry of the plant in the middle after each process or at the end of the process. The main control parameters we use is temperature, conductivity, pH, organic matter that we mentioned before as uh, biological oxygen demand or chemical oxygen demand, the total suspended solids, the nutrients which be nitrogen, phosphorus, fecal coliform, solid parasites, oils and grease. So the, we can measure other parameters, but the main ones, the ones that we usually have to measure to comply with the environmental routines is these parameters we have here. Next slide. So we here want to share something about our experience in the field with the simple treatment plants, semi-decentralized, between 1,000 and 30,000 inhabitants where with a combination of pre-treatment processes, the anaerobic process, then anaerobic process that is very simple, we can get to these levels of efficiency. So you can see over there how in organic uh, load and uh, DBO, we can get into the plant between 300, 400, up to 600 milligrams per liter, and the output is in less than 30. So the efficiency of removal in these plants, no matter how simple they are, may be of 90, 95% without any problem. And you can also see that the efficiency for the removal of nutrients is low. We see over there in the image, to the right, only 37% of removal of nitrogen and only 39% of reduction or, or remo removal of phosphorus. This is because of a couple of things. Number one, because these are simple plants where we do not have a process of, uh, to remove the nitrogen and we don't have any chemical precipitation process to remove the phosphorus. So in these cases, that we have not come to that advanced level and we have not wanted to do that because the water from these plants that I'm going to tell you about and that I'm going to show you in some later images are all for the reuse water, wastewater reuse in reforestation, in agriculture, irrigation and so on. So it makes no sense to remove all the nitrogen and the phosphorus because we would be removing the nutrients for the plants. While the soil and the plants can help us do this treatment, this removal of nitrogen and phosphorus without a cost, basically. So when do we have to remove nitrogen and phosphorus? Well, this is when we are powering into a water body, especially if you are powering into a lagoon. So in order not to contaminate this uh, lagoon, it makes a lot of sense to invest in the removal of the nutrients. But if the reuse is going to be for agricultural irrigation, you do not remove those two. Next slide. And the same thing in the terms of a sludge. You will want to reuse the sludge because that's what's desirable because they can become a soil improving agent. It improves the structure of the soil. So it is very important to do the monitoring of the quality of the sludge. So especially we have to see that there are no heavy metals. So when you do the treatment of the wastewater in the whole city, for example, and the area for the collection of wastewater includes industrial areas, industrial parks, uh, shops, factories, and so on. And very likely, these industrial, liquid industrial waste gets into the sewage, gets into the trimming plant, and the heavy metals will come up in the sludge. If we exceed certain levels, then the sludge cannot be used in agriculture because of the heavy metals. When we work in a more decentralized way and we attend, for example, some uh, dorm districts where people live, where there's condos, urbanizations, houses, and so on, where there is no big industrial areas, then there it is easier because we do not have that presence of heavy metals in the wastewater and therefore the sludge is not deposited. Next slide. And we have here the topic of the nutrients, the sludge. 
also has uh, nutrients that can be used by the soil and the plants when we use that sludge. There's nitrogen, phosphorus, as well as ammonia in the sludge. Next slide. Now I'm going to show a little bit of the experience, specific experiences that we have implemented in the last 10, 15 years in Bolivia. This one, for example, is a plant for an urban center of 10,000 inhabitants. The plant is two kilometers from the urban center. At the distance, you can see a little bit of the urban part. But what is interesting in this part is that the water that used to end up in the river now comes to this plant. It is treated, and the water that is treated helps to irrigate all the plantations around. If I'm not wrong, it's 60 hectares around the plant, and you can see the corn over there. This plant do not have a disinfection phase, so we'll use other barriers. In this case, with the treated water, we irrigate alfalfa and corn, not lettuce, not tomato, or food that can be consumed raw, but just a, a food that is, or, or produce that is processed or cooked. This is an image on how the farmers who are neighbors to the plant, how they connect their hoses to a collection canal that is around the plant, and with the treated water, they irrigate the corn. Next slide. Right here, you can see another system. These are anaerobic ascendant flow reactors, both of the tanks that are covered, and then they are followed with an aeration process with the uh, disseminators and the treated waters to irrigate all those hectares around the plant too. So this is a treatment that's a little bit more advanced than the previous one. The previous one was where the wetlands, the uh, stone biofilters, so they do not need the use of energy. But in this case, we have to pump air into the secondary treatment. Next slide. We can see here the area of influence. We have the plant that I showed you a while ago in the middle and then the green spots had 20, about 21 hectares in one side and then 18 on the other side. Next slide. This is a part of the sludge. The sludge is extracted from the anaerobic reactors. The sludge has already digested. They have been several months in the reactor. And as we take them out, we just dry them in the sun. Once they're dry, they can be incorporated to the soil to improve the soil and improves the structure of the soil. It helps uh, provide minerals. They still have some organic loads, some nutrients, and especially salts that improve the soil. Next slide. So you can see in the left how the sludge comes out of the reactor and then how it is dried uh, on the right side. Water goes back into the process, goes back into the treatment plant and the solids remain up there and get dried. Next slide. This is a plan specifically for sludge treatment. So in this plant, we bring sludge that is extracted from the aerobic treatment of other wastewater plants, or it could also be sludge coming from septic tanks from in situ solutions. So there may be a tank truck that collects from some city areas that do not have a sewage system and they have septic tanks, so they collect the septic sludge and that can be treated in a plant of this type or a different type, but this is a sludge treatment plant. In this case, we make a process that is called uh, wet composting and basically we aerate the sludge to turn them into fertilizer. In this case, a liquid fertilizer stabilized that can include also urea. If it includes urea, it is a bit more potentiated as a fertilizer, but in this case, it's a disinfected fertilizer at 60 degrees, so all uh, microorganisms that are harmful die. Next slide. So what we want to do with this treatment system uh, decentralized and with, the, with this reuse approach is to change the paradigm. The previous paradigm has been basically to bring nutrients to the city in the form of food. Then food is produced in the field, they are brought to the city, in the city we consume them and then 
we discard that in the sewage as a symbol. So this follows a linear logic. It has a beginning, it has an end, and then it ends in the sewage with or without treatment and then no water. So what we are doing here is basically to see the phosphorus is the most important nutrient for the plants. It is like the bottleneck of life, as uh, somebody said in a given moment. And then there's a crisis of phosphorus. Phosphorus is really uh, bad distributed among the world. Only three, four countries have basically 80, 90 percent of the reserves of phosphorus in the world. And the price is going up. And ag the agriculture, as we know it right now, is based on phosphorus. So if there's no phosphorus uh, mines, it ends up in the oceans or in the rivers because of the sewage system, and then we cannot recover this. So we really have to change this paradigm. Next slide, and then move to a logic of circular economy, where instead of it ending up in the water, those nutrients, both the nitrogen as well as phosphorus or potassium, have to be recovered and returned into the ground, into the soil, into nature, for them to continue the cycle. So on the one hand, we have the cycle of water that we have to take care of, the previous slide, and not to interrupt it. And then we have this cycle of the nutrients where we also have to recover this. So the big problem is when we mix the water cycle with the cycle of the nutrients, because then it's very difficult to separate. Next slide now. So changing this paradigm of this uh, linear economy or to a circular economy is a challenge for the coming years, protecting the water, protecting the cycles of nutrients and water, incorporating this philosophy or this approach of the circular economy instead of the linear economy. So we're going to see this in practice, how in, in those plans that you've seen before, you're going to see how we've done this change of part time. In the upper part, you can see that linear, we have the wells that are perforated in the areas where we have worked. The water from those wells is uh, pumped. It goes to the city as potable water. The city contaminates the water and the wastewater without treatment ended up in the river. And in parallel, around the cities, we have other wells that are perforated to pump clean water to irrigate crops that are also partially irrigated by rain and by pumped water. And in addition, fertilizers have to be introduced into the crops. So we have here that also parallel linear economy. Uh, on the one hand, the potable water, the waste water, and then the water for irrigation and crops. Next slide. So with this change of a paradigm, what we do is that first we construct the treatment plant to treat city waters. Next slide or next uh, bit. So with that, we are protecting the cycle of water because we treat the water before they go to the river. So we have good quality water in the river. There's going to be better infiltration. There's going to be recharge and there's still going to be wells who are taking care of that part of the water cycle. But then with the treatment, next uh, click, we can canalize uh, that water to irrigate the crops. So we can use treated water instead of using the wells or at least to providing some of that oil pumping water. Next. So in that way, we are reducing the pressure over the aquifers and we are reducing the need of perforating more wells and pumping water for the crops. So in this case, the crops will be irrigated with rain and with treated wastewater. So we are bringing water, treated water to the crop, but we're also adding nutrients. And in that way, we are improving and protecting the water cycle as well as the cycle of the nutrients and we're separating them. Next. So right here, you can see as a case study, three uh, intermediate cities, one of them 30,000 inhabitants or 20,000 inhabitants, if I'm not wrong. The other one is 10,000. The other one is even smaller, is about 5,000 inhabitants. It's the same region. 
So it's three small urban centers in that region. And we have agricultural activity between these urban centers. And to the left, you can see a lake, a lake that used to be contaminated with the wastewater of these three urban centers. Next. So what we've done is an analysis to campaign, looking at these three locations and see what happened with the wastewater under this linear economy scheme where they were not treated and just parked into the river. And what happens now when the water is treated and reused for agricultural activities? In the case of the organic load, for example, if there used to be 241,000 kilos per year getting into the river, now it's only 6,000 getting into the river. So there's been a reduction of 235,000 kilos. That's a reduction of 97% of organic uh, load ending in the river. So it is not 100%, it's 97%. Why? Because number one, the treatment is not perfect. It doesn't have 100% efficiency. And number two, because only 60% of the water ends up irrigating the crops and 40% of the water is uh, discharged in the river, but once it's treated. So the farmers do not irrigate the whole year. In the past, when they just depended on the water, they had only one harvest per year. Now they have two harvests per year. So and sometimes they do not irrigate, usually because it's raining. But So that's 40% still goes to the river, but already treated. Something similar happens with suspended solids. As you can see, the for nutrients, it's uh, less because of what we have mentioned already, but there is a reduction of approximately 60% of nutrients that do not end up in the river, but in the agricultural field. Without having a sophisticated uh, treatment like chemical precipitation or any other. With simple technologies, but going through the reuse, we can get to that remission of 60% of the nutrients. And finally, we can also reduce the import of fertilizers because part of the fertilization is done through the way treated wastewater. We would also be reducing in this case into 196,000 cubic meters per year the production of uh, clean water for irrigation. We will be reducing the pressure on these uh, wells. So many of those wells will not be needed for irrigation. Next slide, and just to come to uh, wrap up and some conclusions. Well, first of all, the best treatment is that there is no need to treat, right? If we can have sanitation systems that do not use water or that use less water, that would be best. If we already have sanitation processes the, like a switch system, so what we have talked about, then we can treat the wastewater with different technologies and at different scales. Once again, the most basic treatment is better than not having anything. If we just have a septic tank, that's a big thing. If we go to a secondary treatment, even better, we can do this uh, in situ. We can do this in condos, in small neighborhoods, in small urban centers, or at the level of the big city too. So no matter the scale, in all scales, we can have either a very simple or a very advanced treatment. There is a whole range of possibilities. This is very interesting and very important for our projects. The fact that the decentralization of the treatment facilitates the reuse of treated water and sludges, the closer we are to the contamination point, the better, I mean, it is true that when we have big treatment plants, the cost per capita goes down, the cost per capita of the treatment. But when we take into account the costs of the whole solution, including the collection networks, the pumping stages, uh, stations, the energy for the pumping stations and so on. So those big plants are not necessarily like the less, uh, least expensive solution. When there are many pumping stations, very likely, the cost for the collection of the wastewater is going to be higher than the cost of the treatment. On the side of the costs. Now, on the side of the efficiency and the possibility of the reuse of uh, 
waste water, it is more interesting to decentralize because we don't have the contamination from the industries. This is where water can be reused. So we need many smaller areas for the wastewater treatment. So if we locate the treatment plants strategically in places where we can use them, then we will be recovering nutrients. We will be implementing a philosophy of a circular economy. And in addition, we are reducing costs. And of course, this can generate multiple benefits, not just from the point of view of health and the environment, but also financial and economic benefits. When you save resources, when you recycle, when you reuse. So I think that was the last slide and thank you very much. We can move to the next one. If there is any question, doubt or conversation you may have, I'm available. Gustavo, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation, extremely relevant to the crew class and with a very good timing. So I think that we're going to have a great opportunity to discuss. We are getting some comments and questions in the chat. So I would like perhaps to open the space. I have a lot of questions, but I would like to give a space for the participants there was a question from Guillermo, from Conagua. Guillermo, if you are there, would you like to open the microphone and ask your question? Guillermo? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Well, basically, well, first of all, I want to congratulate Gustavo for the presentation. That was very interesting. We, from Conagua, participated in an international technical cooperation to Bolivia precisely in the topic of wastewater treatment. We were at the level of the government. We provided some assistance precisely in a cooperation scheme with uh, Germany, with the JZ. And we worked basically with the Ministry of the Environment in Bolivia and with the department government of Cochabamba. So we were very interested about the presentation. And my question basically is in terms of how the Aguatuya institution works with the local governments. It is not very clear for me if it is like a uh, company, an NGO, what is the relationship that you have with the local governments of Bolivia in the projects that you mentioned? So basically, that's my question. Sure, Guillermo, it's great to hear you. We are quite aware of this triangular cooperation with the JIZ in Mexico and also in Mexico, you're experts in water reuse. It's one of the countries that's reusing more water for agriculture, so that's very interesting. Aguatuya is a nonprofit foundation. It is basically like an NGO. We've been working for 15 years in water and sanitation, and our way of working is especially with the municipalities on our part or our counterpart is the municipalities, but we do work also with the international cooperation. Especially we have worked with Switzerland and Sweden in the last 10 years at least. So on behalf of the cooperation, we have technical assistance uh, funds and part of the investment. Usually we work with the municipalities that have some local knowledge and the need or they're in charge of the basic services. So we work with them from planning. In Aguatuya, we work on topics of uh, the engineering and management of water. So we see that in the part of the management of the services, which is something that I have not really mentioned in the presentation, we see that that part of service management is as important as the infrastructure. Because in the last 15 years, in the whole of Latin America, and Bolivia is not an exception, a lot of emphasis has been given to the investment in infrastructure. So all these big problems from IDB, the World Bank, the governments, and so on, they all have invested a lot 
in water system and sewage system treatment plants and so on. And many of those plants do not work. And if they do not work, it is not necessarily because they are not well built or designed, but there is nobody to operate them or there is no good uh, fees that to generate the necessary monthly cash flow to pay for power or for a good technical team to manage the plants and so on. So the approach in Aguatulla is to work with the municipalities in engineering and management. We plan with the municipality the topic of waste uh, water and solid waste. And we also get support from the cooperation for subsidies. So those plans that uh, I shared with you in the presentation, for example, 50% has been covered with international cooperation in terms of infrastructure, and 50% has been covered by the municipalities themselves. And the topic of uh, management, we work by developing the competence of the municipal water company for them to know how to operate the plan, how to do the right maintenance. And in some cases, it's even also the communities that are the operators and owners of the plants. But as long as they're organized as a kind of service cooperative or water committee that they have said uh, fees and that they have institutionality and everything for the sustainability of the service, you know. That's the way in which we operate. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And just a quick comment that I also wrote it in the chat and precisely related to the comment you make, Gustavo. In Mexico, for example, a problem we have is that the plants are built and then the operation is in the municipalities. And in Mexico, there are many plants that unfortunately their operation is not very efficient precisely because of that problem. Many times from the municipal authorities to be able to get resources for the operation of the plants. So there are plants that unfortunately are not operating or they're not operating efficiently. So that experience that you're telling us that you have developed in Bolivia is very interesting because that is a big problem in Mexico and also in many other countries that the plants are built, and as you were saying, uh, the, sometimes it's not so much the project for the construction, but the operation of the plants. That, that would be like an issue in some cases, but we are very interested on what you have just mentioned, and congratulations for that work you're doing and that experience you have developed. So on my part, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Guillermo. Gustavo, maybe I am going to take advantage of this comment Guillermo made with the topic of operation because there are several questions in the chat that are related to how we work on this mechanism. I mean, the plan is built. I guess it belongs to the municipality. But the topic of the reuse, I mean, is there any business model around the reuse? The farmer pays for the water or you actually pay them for using the water? So... What are the models? Because there are many questions around the costs and so on for the operation. So maybe you can tell you, tell us a little bit more about that experience. Sure. Actually, we have both cases. In some cases, it is the municipality itself that delivers the water and charges either by cubic meter or by pumping hour. In the regions where we have worked, Paying for water is something normal because the main source for agriculture in that region is so well water. So when an agricultural uh, union or a group of farmers get together and they make their own well, they have to pay for the pumping energy. So they, they charge for pumping hour. But on the other hand, at the municipal level, there has been another interesting case, which is that the community that is interested in irrigation water has uh, given some plots for the construction of the plant, which would otherwise be very complicated to get the land for the construction of the plant, especially when we're talking about peri-urban or urban areas or nobody wants to have a treatment plant in their backyard, right? So there's a lot of social resistance to the construction of these plants. But in this case, 
when we have demonstrated that the plants that we have developed would not generate any bad odors, such as some of the plants that we used to have in the past, there were no mosquito problems or anything like that. So the, the farmers on their own benefit would say, okay, we can give a thousand, ten thousand square meters for the construction of the plants in exchange of us being able to use the treated water at no cost. So that was another model that also was uh, used, but it has given us a way to uh, work with these plants without opposition because it was for their own interest. So it's been an interesting experience. Great. And um, tell us a little bit, I mean, the cost of the operation. I mean, the operation itself, the cost is uh, on the part of the municipality. I mean, yeah, in the municipal systems, the cost is assumed by the municipality, but that uh, part of the cost is transferred to the storage uh, fees because the municipalities, they have their own portable water services or they have a municipal decentralized company that operates with sewage systems and so on. And many times they either don't have a plant or they do not use the plant. So in this case, we implement the plan and together with the water and such a bill, they get a certain amount that they have to uh, pay to cover the cost of the plan. Now, what we always do is the cost analysis, of course, that we do as soon as possible, either before building, before offer offering a service, so that the municipality and the users, everyone is aware about the real costs. So we make a cost analysis in two side, with two sides, the CAPEX and OPEX, the investment by component and how much it component lasts in time. Like the pumps that have to be uh, replaced every five, seven, ten years maximum, especially if they're not uh, so big by the physical works that may last 20, 30 years. So whatever is used. And then we have the part of OPEX operation maintenance. So how much is needed every month to operate and maintain the plan? Salaries and power and input and so on. So we make the calculation and we bring it to a cost per capita or a cost per cubic meter. And the methodology we use is an unequivalent cost. We have a couple of publications that we have done in Aguatulla about this topic that have been very useful. Because when we have all that cost for investment as well as operation maintenance per capita, then we say, okay, for this plan, for the service to last forever for children and grandchildren, then we more or less need so many dollars per month per person or per household. So we get to like a total cost per household. So just to say that a plant, one of these that we see is completely sustainable with a payment of, let's say, $2 or two and a half dollars per month per household. So that would mean that would make the service 100% sustainable. But suddenly, I mean, some people, people cannot pay that rate of two and a half dollars per month, but maybe they can pay for one dollar or one dollar a half. So we see that with one dollar and a half per household per month, you can cover 100% of the cost of operation maintenance. And part of the cost for the maintenance of the capital for the investment. So that part is uh, subsidized by the municipal government. In, in other cases, maybe the users can cover this through the rates, and that's much better, but that is not always the case. Okay, so I don't know if uh, I still have this. This is like the costing tool in beta, the work that you did with the World Bank. The citywide inclusive sanitation, Gustavo participated. I don't know, you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. 
we have this costing tool because there's a couple of questions about the costs. And this is a tool that, well, Gustavo took me a tour of this a couple of months ago, and I think it is very interesting. And at the end, this ends up being like a database where you put together the costs from different experiences. And so by region, by country, and by technology, you can have kind of an approach to the costs of a project. So I think that this is a component that we can do in the future as part of the academy, where we can go deeper into this you know, cost topics using this tool. But this is more like an announcement or, than anything else. Uh, Gustavo, there is a question from David. David, maybe you want to open your camera and your microphone. Well, thank you very much, Gustavo, for the excellent presentation. And thank you, Joaquin. I think that these the argument we use to introduce centralized systems is uh, very interesting because we're talking about the cost. And in Cochabamba, with some exercises we did with IDB, we realized that sometimes putting primary and secondary to replace the most elaborated plans was convenient for reuse to make an effective and reduced uh, cost in order to obtain this uh, reuse by the farmer. So my question was around the costs. The average cost that you could have, what would it be by cubic meter of the what treated water in a plant, for example, for 10,000 inhabitants? And from there, we can extrapolate. And thank you very much for this instrument that Joaquin is also sharing. I think it's very useful. So just the reference of uh, investment cost, we're talking about the initial capex that will have to be provided by the municipality as well as by the funding entity in this case. Yeah, the total cost was in around 20 cents of a dollar per cubic meter, total cost, including capex and opex. So I would say half of that was the capex, half of that was the opex. But I have some uh, templates with all the detail that you can also find in the cloud. So I can send you the link for you to have access to that information. Actually, the calculation comes from this methodology that we have used with the World Bank that Joaquin was mentioning a while ago. And in the chat, I have put the link to that, which is cityscostingtool.com. It's into, uh, I put it in the chat of the group. And precisely in that tool, we make this analysis of the capex and opex, but not just for the treatment plan, but for all the sanitation chain. What goes inside the house, uh, the joints, the collection network, and finally, the treatment, and even putting things into the reuse. Because that analysis has to be done for the whole sanitation solution in terms of the treatment. The number that I have in my memory is about 20 cents of a dollar per cubic meter. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Yeah, the, the bigger the plan, the lower that would be, okay? Super, thank you, David. And we also have some other questions in the chat. Let me see. The topic of business models has already been commented. I've seen another one here. Elvira. I know it is not a question, it's more a comment, but I don't know. Uh, she says that this project, as Gustavo was presenting this, I was recalling a lot about Savannah Jagua, so maybe Elvira, you want to make a comment? Yes, and good morning, everyone. Yeah, I, I'm interested in that initiative. I think it can be implemented on the reuse, and we can give more uh, advertising of this in Cabana de Hueso, as Joaquin has just said, in the sense that awareness raising is going to help in doing uh, local reuse, because right here in the Dominican Republic, we are very weak in this. We usually do not believe in that type of reuse for the water. And the comment that I was making is that we do need to uh, communicate the importance 
and do sanitation systems just as we have for portable water i mean in the countries more importance is given to collection of water to bring it to the user but the collection for treatment we know that in the countries including our country dominican republic we have weaknesses for the collection i mean the systems many of them are uh stuck to joaquin would uh, prove me right with the Savannah Jago project that has been paralyzed for 30 years and that water is going directly to the water bodies because of a lack of uh, sometimes just follow-up for operationality and maintenance. Uh, Dominican Republic is not exempt to that situation. I like this topic of the circular economy that Gustavo was talking about. And this is something that the countries should also pay attention to, including the Dominican Republic, giving more visibility to this so that we can find the costs as well as the application of these in the sanitation system. So as I said, it was basically a comment and congratulations. Well, thank you, Elvina. Gustavo? Yeah, just let me reply a little bit to the comment. The topic of communication is super important and the way in which we have approached the communication in these places was because the the river was really bad. I mean, it was completely black with a lot of bad odor. It was visibly in a bad condition. So nobody likes that. We have started there. We have some uh, billboards in the city and the market and so on. How do you like your city? How do you like your river? You want it like this, you want it like that. And we put the two contrasting pictures, how your city could be and how your city is. So this is uh, very important for us. This is one of the ways in which we have approached this um, treatment of the wastewater. Then, talking about the reuse, it has not been an objective in itself from us. This is something that has occurred because there has been demand for this. But there are other places where it rains a lot, where there is a good rain level of rainfall. And perhaps it's not necessary to talk so much about the reuse in agriculture. But in that case, we have to do some more advanced treatment, especially if it's going to be discharged into lakes or rivers with a slow flow rate. So I think that when we talk about reuse, this has to be promoted when there is a need, a demand, a real opportunity. And it may be different things. When we work at the urban level, the reuse for smaller plants, for example, in condos and urban districts is more for uh, forestation and municipal parks and some uh, sports fields. There are some places where they have like a soccer field that is just dirt because they don't have the water to irrigate it. But once they get the water, they even rent the soccer field and everything and they get some income because they will be able to grow the grass in there. So we have seen all those other, let's say, unexpected effects of reuses that are not necessarily agricultural. Thank you very much. I have posted my email on the chat if somebody would like to have a clarification or some additional information. Super, Gustavo, thank you very much. And Leah, maybe you want to open the microphone and tell us a little bit or ask your question. Well, now that I can work with the microphone, first of all, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. I am 100% in agreement that the minimum treatment is better than no treatment at all. Likewise, it could be that the water may have a pollutant that without treating it could even damage the plants. If water is too acid, if there are modern contaminants such as antibiotics or because of the local geology, there may be heavy metals, for example. So my question is, if those, let's say, special or modern contaminants have been uh, localized in uh, Bolivia, if you have identified them or treated them, 
because I know that in the case of antibiotics, it is very complicated and it's also very costly to treat them. So my question is up to which point water has been analyzed and if there has been some analysis in the plants, for example. Well, what we have analyzed in depth is the heavy metals because we're very afraid that the sludge we're generating and reusing could contain elevated levels of heavy metals. So we have made the analysis. We had uh, chrome and zinc and cadmium and several others, and they were all within ranges that are not harmful. Actually, this lodge complied with the Swedish uh, standards. This is what we're working with the Swedish Embassy in Bolivia. We do not have regulations for that. So it complied with the parameters from Sudan in terms of antibiotics and those emerging contaminants or new contaminants. We have not made any study, any analysis yet. However, in many places where they've done those studies and where they want to remove those contaminants, they're using some uh, processes and we're using the ascending flow anaerobic reactors. In the case of the artificial wetlands, artificial wetlands with or without plants, in the case of those that have plants, there should be some removal of those new contaminants, but this is not something that we have measured or controlled in any other way. Thank you. I think that even in those rural areas, those emerging contaminants are, are not as frequent as they may be in big cities, like in other countries. In the case of the heavy metals, is there any reason why, I mean, if you were expecting high uh, contents, my question is why were you expecting high context and if you have detected any reason of why they were not over some of these limit values because as I understand they had not been treated. No, it was not that we expected those high levels, but we have those high levels. We were collecting the waters from our small urban centers. So there may be some factories and so on, but it was not like such a big city. but it is, oh, those metals are not getting into the switch. Probably the industry we're talking about here is more like manufacturing businesses. The problems with the city is much bigger where you have like uh, leather tanning or industrial parks or things like that. This is where you can find some of the heavy metals, but that is one of the most important reasons to decentralize because once you have the heavy metals in the sludge or in your sludge, there is not much you can do. It is uh, not worth treating the sludge to remove the heavy metal. The cost benefit is not worth it. So it's better to do that. And decentralization is the key point. Thank you. Well, thank you. I had a couple of questions, perhaps very briefly. The topic of irrigation in the crops, how do you get organized? I mean, how many cubic meters per producer? How do you organize that? Do you put pipelines through the farms? Can you tell us a little bit more about that part? Well, where we have worked, there were already some uh, farmer associations that were already organized. So in a way, they already have an irrigation system. And what they do, is to just put the treated water into that system. But in other cases where they didn't have an irrigation system and they only had rain, then they themselves get organized. But the organizational structure, let's say, of the community for the farmers that already existed. So it's basically that they get organized. We didn't do anything but just to make water available to them. Okay, so that really facilitates things. Yeah, like uh, putting a pumping system for irrigation to the plant itself. In the past, we have constructed irrigation systems that had nothing to do 
with wastewater, but it had to do with the well water. And we have constructed some pipelines that would get to like the heads of the parcels. And from there, the farmers would take the water to irrigate. But it is a very interesting system when you can develop a network similar to the portable water network, but with this irrigation water. So you give the farmer not just water, but you give water with a pressure. So in that case, they could use either dripping micro sprays, sprays, and so on. So the value is even more because you're giving them water and power, right? But in terms of uh, wastewater, what we have done so far, the experiences so far have been of irrigation by gravity or pumping to the parcel or to a canal that they may have had and under their own organization. Okay. I got the idea now, and I don't know if you have had any experience. Oh, could I ask something, please? I'm Patricia from Honduras. I just want to continue with this topic of agriculture, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, Patricia. I just wanted to ask, with the topic of irrigation, I'm an agronomist engineer, and this topic of irrigation is very interesting because the state provided this uh, water with a low level of potassium that is very soluble for the plants. And the main like a difference between the application of fertilizer, nitrogen, and potassium, what is commonly done in fertilization, and what they had in treated water, they made a cost-benefit analysis. And we've made this study, and um, it's been interesting and important because it also brings me to another topic. Treated water or untreated water, they have higher levels of salinity than the fresh water. So it is not a good idea to irrigate exclusively with wastewater because then we run the risk of salinizing the uh, soil. So it's uh, what's ideal is to use the treated water as supplementary irrigation, supplementary to rain or uh, supplementary to a normal well irrigation. We have made studies in terms of uh, sludge treatment when we have generated the liquid fertilizer using the wastewater and the sludges. We have done the process of wet composting by aeration and Oh, I, I, without using urea, just for the wastewater and the sludge, but going through the aerobic reactor in this case. In that case, we've made a study. I am not a specialist in that topic, so I do not have, like, all the information. We have worked with the Proimpa Foundation in Bolivia, that they are experts in uh, the uh, crops of potato and corn and so on. So we have done some control parcels with them precisely to determine the availability of the nutrients for the plants, the increase in production, etc. And the results have been very positive, but I, I don't have the numbers right now. But if you need that information, I can send you that via email. Where the effect has been Visual and completely evident has been in one of the pictures that I show you where we have the corn around the plant, especially because of this uh, security that they were going to have the water supply. Because when they depended only on rain, they were waiting and waiting and waiting for rain to fall. And many times they would go over the time of the crops. So they were just depending a lot on that very valuable factor. And since the plant came to the place, they can plant the corn on the best day of the year to plant. They do that. And then whether or not it rains, their harvest is guaranteed because they use this wastewater. So they could be confident about that. And they have gone from one harvest a year to two harvests a year. And they were saying, no, my, my corn's bigger. My cups are bigger. Plants are taller. So the improvement was completely evident. So we have to see this at a longer term. I have to combine with other types of irrigation so that we do not make 
the soil more saline. There are some places where soil is more acid, and in those places, it's great. It's a great thing. Because if, when you put organic matter and salts to the soil, you're improving it a lot. The problem may be in places where water is already saline, where the soil is already saline, so we have to take all this into account. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia, for the question. There was a question here. I don't see it now, but I read it initially, and it has to do with the type of technology, Gustavo. I mean, you're using, and I can I ask my question into this one. You're already using the aerobic part. You're using the biofilters of intermittent flow, I guess. I don't know if it's just one step or if you do some type of recirculation. That's my question. And the other part of it is why not using the wetlands or why don't we see the wetlands in these systems? What is the experience you have with the use of those wetlands? And I asked Rosa's question too. She's asking about this anaerobic uh, combination with the wetlands. Is there no issues of lack of oxygen for the plants in the wetland? So it's like a big uh, combo of things. Sure. Well, many years ago, we have been using the biofilters, the gravel biofilters. We have used both horizontal as well as vertical. The horizontal filters, basically 80 centimeters depth, 20 or 15 without water, and 60 at the bottom with water, for them to be the least anaerobic that's possible. Some of them are with plants, some others without plants. And the fact of putting the plants also implies work and additional exp expenses. So in some cases where we didn't have that will from the municipality of having somebody that is in charge of checking all the plants and everything, we have let that just as a gravel biofilter without plants. And in other cases, with plants. So. With regards to the final, uh, the quality of the output and the efficiency of removal, it is evident that the wetlands or the biofilters are more efficient. In those plants, we have a better outflow. So with an anaerobic reactor followed by a horizontal biofilter, we would have an output of about 60 milligrams per liter, for example. But with the vertical one, we have decreased that to 20, 25 milligrams per liter. So there's more efficiency in the vertical biofilter. And with or without plants, that is more an operational thing, I would say. We're recently running tests with some plants that are like specific for this topic. I don't remember their name though, but we want to try and do more like the wetlands with plants. The other system we have used that is excellent is using an ascending flow anaerobic reactor followed by an aerobic system with air blower with diffusers, and in that case, well, you have a different process, it is more advanced, but when you combine this aerobic treatment with the ascending flow and aerobic reactor, you basically lower to the half the total costs compared to a traditional active sludge plant. So on the one hand, you reduce the total cost to have, and then you reduce also the amount of sludge and the sludge that you get from the ascending flow reactors. So you can see all the advantages of that other combination. We use that when there is little space because when we do the biofilters and the wetlands, you need more square meters. Perfect. I also wanted to mention here in the chat, Susanna has just uploaded the evaluation for this webinar. We thank you very much. If you can fill this up and you can, in addition to qualifying this uh, webinar, it would be great to hear from you for the next webinars. This is the first block of the Crew Plus Academy. 
And the idea is to do three, four more blogs. For example, if this topic of the reuse you think is very interesting and you want us to elaborate even more in a series of webinars or in a more complete course about the reuse, then the only way for us to know is if you tell us so that we can start structuring those things. So we really appreciate if you fill out that evaluation format. With this, it's already 10.30, but no problem. What's important is to share the information. So if there is no other very important question, well, anyway, Gustavo has shared his email. You also have the contact for the Crew Press Project, and you can also ask the questions there. We hope that in the coming days, we will be sending you a follow-up mail with the link for you to download the presentation and for you to be able to have access to this video and that you can socialize it and share it with the colleagues. And without further ado, I would like to tell you, thank you very much, Gustavo, for the effort of the presentation. Very relevant experience. The chat is actually full of very positive comments about the webinar. So really, thank you very much. And we hope that we can count on you in coming webinars. No, well, thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. See you soon. Perfect. Perfect. Bye-bye, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you all.